It is evident that even at a young age, children and teenagers are capable of committing horrific violent crimes. However, it's also widely known that a person's upbringing and environment can play a significant role in shaping their life and the actions they take. The story of Catherine and Curtis Jones is a perfect example of these two realities colliding. At just 13 and 12 years old, these siblings were already embroiled in a world of criminal activities, having suffered many traumatic experiences during their tender age. These experiences ultimately led them to a place of ruthless planning and execution of those they deemed as their primary oppressors. Greetings and a warm welcome to Criminus, where we delve into the dark and intriguing tales of the criminal underworld. Today, we will be exploring a story that has remained a mystery until now, the first youngest convicted adult murderers, Catherine and Curtis Jones. Are you curious to uncover the tragic events that led these two young individuals to a life of violence and crime and at such a tender age? Do you want to uncover the hidden details surrounding the youngest adult criminal case in history? Stay tuned to this video as we unravel the truth and shed light on the Jones siblings. Get ready to be captivated by the mysterious and disturbing story of Catherine and Curtis Jones as we delve into the factors that influenced their descent into a life of crime. So sit back, relax, and let us embark on this journey of discovery and enlightenment. The youngsters were being sexually abused by one of those family members. Child welfare workers found evidence of abuse at least twice, and yet the abuser was allowed to remain in the same home with them. The brother and sister, the youngest at the time... Catherine Jones was born in 1985 to Curtis Jones, Esser, and Stacy Parks. Although her exact date of birth is unknown, what is known is the tragic circumstances surrounding her premature birth. Her mother, Stacy, was a victim of physical abuse at the hands of her husband, Curtis Esser, shortly after they started dating. One particularly violent outburst of Curtis while assaulting his wife resulted in Stacy's uterus tearing and Catherine being born prematurely. A year after Catherine was born, the couple gave birth to a son on the 31st of May, 1986, and was named Curtis Fairchild Jones Jr. The family lived together in Brevard County, Florida. They seemed to live in happiness as to what was obvious to the kids, seeing their parents all smiles and lively. What was oblivious to them was that their mother was suffering from physical abuse from their father. As the kids grew up, the violent abuse of Curtis towards his wife intensified, despite Stacy's best efforts to hide the abuse from her children, and they eventually became aware of the situation later on. In 1989, Stacy could no longer endure the abuse and left the family home, leaving her two children, who were four and three years old then, with Curtis Sr., she took the decision of not taking her kids with her due to the fear of her mother rejecting them, as the kids were biracial. She would regret this decision, as it soon became clear that all was not well with her children in their father's care. The kids stayed with their father and enjoyed his company, which was soon later threatened. You know, in the report, you know, they said there were indicators of abuse, and um, my brother told me he believed me. He said, I know it's true because it's happened to me too. A few years after Stacy left the house, a male relative of Curtis moved into the family home to live with them. He had some challenges and Curtis was there to help him, and he accepted him in his house as they were relatives. Things seemed all right at first, but this relative was soon revealed to be a dangerous man with criminal records of robbery and even child molestation. He was a chronic pedophile who has been convicted of sexual assaults involving his then-girlfriend's daughter, whom he took advantage of causing him to spend over six years in prison. It is unclear whether Curtis knew of the criminal history of his relative, or he purposely turned a blind eye towards it. Whichever the case might be, his dangerous relative started molesting his kids also. Stacy's decision to leave her children with their father in the face of abuse was devastating and would have long-lasting consequences for her children. The presence of a dangerous predator in their home only compounded the tragedy of their situation, leading to a lifetime of pain and suffering for Catherine and Curtis Jr. In 1994, the truth about the relative's behavior finally came to light when Curtis Jr. and Catherine went to visit their mother and he confided in his mom. 
Stacy, about the relative's inappropriate behavior towards him. He told her that the relative whose name wasn't revealed had been molesting him and fondling him in the room they both shared. Outraged by the revelation of her son, Stacy immediately reported the case to the police, who launched an investigation into the case. However, the investigation was short-lived, as Curtis Jur was pressured into retracting his statement and claiming that he had been lying which led to the investigation being closed. Despite her best efforts to protect her children, Stacy was unable to intervene and stop the abuse. Catherine, too, was suffering at the hands of the relative who had been harassing her sexually also, but her attempts to tell her father about the abuse were met with disbelief as her father refused to believe her and took the side of the relative. This only added to the trauma and isolation she was already experiencing. Unfortunately, both Catherine and Curtis continued to suffer abuse at the hands of this relative. Catherine even ran away from school one day and told her teacher that she had been sexually abused, which she reported to the police. Despite several investigations by the authorities, the abuse was never truly addressed, but the investigators warned Curtis about his relative and the danger he posed to the kids due to his sexual criminal records. This was a turning point in the tragedy that had befallen the Jones family, as it allowed the abuse to continue unchecked. I already knew it was fixing to happen. We had already talked about it, and she was sitting at the other dining room table. And um, he shot her in the chest. And um, she tried to grab the phone, and I went and took the phone. And I took, took it to the back room, and I came back. And um, I can't say how- As the years up. passed, Catherine and Curtis Jr. were left to endure the abuse in silence. The relative's presence in their home was a constant threat and they lived in fear of his next attack. Despite the efforts of their mother to seek justice and claim the custodianship of her children, no substantial pieces of evidence were seen by the police, so the case was dismissed. The kids were unable to escape the abuse, and their childhood was forever mirrored by the trauma they endured. Curtis soon brought his girlfriend, Sonia Nicole Spates, to live with them in the family home. This only compounded the anger and resentment felt by the siblings, who believed that Sonia was the reason for their father's lack of attention toward their complaints. The children felt hopeless, and like no one was going to listen to them, leading them to take matters into their own hands. The anger and hurt that Catherine and Curtis Jr. felt had awoken a monster within them. Catherine started plotting to eliminate her father, his relative, and Sonia, believing that if she took their lives, the harassment would finally come to an end. She even convinced her younger brother to help her with her plan after briefing him on the details of her evil plot. On the 16th of January, 1999, when Catherine was 13 and Curtis Jr. was 12, they decided to take their revenge. They waited until their father and relative were out of the house and then made their move. They planned on killing their targets one after the other without suspicion because they would be overpowered easily if the trio were to be together. Nickel was the only one at home and was innocently playing with puzzles at the dining table. Little did she know that her life was about to be taken from her in a brutal and senseless act of violence. Catherine went into her father's room, took his 9mm pistol shotgun and approached Nickel. Nicole, who was shocked when she saw Catherine pointing a gun toward her, stood up and walked backwards. She tried to calm Catherine down, but it was too late. Catherine was consumed by rage in the quest for revenge and fired multiple shots at the 29-year-old Nicole, who fell to the ground after being hit four times in the stomach. Curtis Jr. then appeared and added to the barrage of bullets, firing at Nicole until she was dead. The siblings were shocked by the consequences of their actions and quickly realized the evil they had committed. They dragged Nichols' body to a corner and cleaned up the bloodstains with bleach to cover up the crime they had committed. They made it look like a robbery scene before running to a neighbor's house to report the incident as robbery, and they shot the gun by accident. The gunshot was loud, and the impact force of the gunshot made Catherine fall backwards when she fired the first shot. The two siblings then fled to nearby woods to hide after reporting to their neighbors. When Curtis Esser returned home, he called out his girlfriend's name and heard no reply. He then searched the rooms one after the other, 
and he couldn't find his girlfriend or his children. Curtis became paranoid, and he was wondering where they could be. He walked past the dining and found Sonia's lifeless body lying on the floor. Curtis was shocked and immediately alerted the police. Curtis Sr. was shocked when he discovered the lifeless body of his girlfriend, Nicole, in their home. He immediately called the police who sprang into action and began an investigation. The police went door to door in the neighborhood, gathering information, and it was then that a neighbor revealed what the kids had told him. The police soon discovered that Curtis Jr. and Catherine were responsible for the crime, and a manhunt was launched to find them. Early the next morning, on January 7, 1999, the two kids were found in the woods and were promptly arrested. The reality of the crime they had committed finally dawned on them, and they became the first minors to be charged as adults for first-degree murder, which would result in a life sentence if found guilty. However, since the children were young, the prosecutor offered them a deal. They would be tried for second-degree murder instead and would be sentenced to 18 years in prison, followed by a lifetime of probation. Catherine and Curtis Jr. accepted the deal, believing it to be the best option given their young and naive state. Throughout the trial, both Catherine and Curtis Jr. remained silent and refused to speak about the reasons behind their actions. They thought they wouldn't be believed, just like in the past. However, their lawyer, Alan Landman, stated that had he been aware of the abuse before the trial, he could have helped them receive a better sentence. The sheriff assigned to the case, Mayor Goodyear, expressed his disappointment in the children's actions, stating that a lot of people had been abused without resorting to murder. He deemed their actions as inexcusable. In August of 1999, Catherine and Curtis Jr. were 14 and 13 years old, respectively and were sentenced to 18 years in prison, followed by a lifetime of probation. You know, nobody understands what you go through in here, but somebody else that's in here. And um, I think that's the worst thing he can do to me right now. Curtis had lived a life of confinement since his teenage years. He spent his prison life in a strict environment structured around daily routines and with limited access to resources. But in 2004, a stroke of luck came his way. A powerful hurricane hit the correctional facility where he was being kept and caused extensive damage. In the chaos that ensued, Curtis and several other teenagers managed to escape. However, their freedom was short-lived as they were recaptured only 24 hours later. As a result of their daring escape, Curtis was handed an extended punishment of 318 days. Five years later, Catherine, Curtis's older sister, revealed the truth behind the murder she had committed in an interview with the Florida Today newspaper. She spoke of the frustration and anger she felt towards her father's girlfriend, Nicole, for stealing their father's attention away from them. Despite feeling guilty about her actions, Catherine was relieved when she was finally sent to prison as she felt safe from the abuse she suffered at the hands of her relative. Curtis and Catherine used to communicate regularly through letters, but that changed when Curtis was moved to a different prison facility. The new warden imposed strict rules and prohibited Curtis from sending letters to anyone. Catherine, who had only seen her younger brother once since they were both incarcerated, felt cut off from the world. It was then that U.S. senior naval officer, Ramis Fleming, stumbled upon Catherine's story and was deeply moved by her experiences. He wrote to her, and they began a correspondence that eventually turned into a friendship. Over time, their bond grew stronger, and in November 2013, 
They got married in a chapel at the Fernando Correctional Institutional. Catherine was 28 years old at the time. With Catherine's impending release, Ramis retired from his job in the Navy to support her in adjusting to life outside of prison. A lot had changed since Catherine was sent to prison at the age of 14, and Ramis wanted to be there for her every step of the way. He was determined to make her transition back into society as smooth as possible and help her build a new life filled with hope and happiness. Catherine and Curtis were released from prison after serving 85% of their original sentence. Catherine was released two weeks before Curtis who got released on 28th July 2015. At the time of their release, they were both 30 and 29 years old, respectively. While in prison, Curtis found solace in religion and was ordained as a Christian minister. He continued to serve as a minister even after his release. On the other hand, Catherine went after a more traditional life. Her marriage to Ramus Fleming later hit the rocks. Despite this setback, Catherine was determined to make a difference in the world and began contributing her efforts to ensure fair sentencing for young people who found themselves in similar circumstances as hers. Despite their troubled past, both Catherine and Curtis worked hard to adapt to life after prison. They tried their best not to violate the rules of their probation, and so far, all appeared to be going smoothly for them. They were making the most of their second chance and working towards a better future. The case of Catherine and Curtis Jones is a testament to the fact that with determination and hard work, anyone can turn their life around. The tragedy of the Jones family is a devastating one, and it highlights the importance of recognizing and addressing abuse in all its forms. The molestation that Catherine and Curtis Jr. suffered at the hands of their father's relative was a betrayal of their trust and safety, and it had far-reaching consequences for their lives. Despite their rough start when they were molested and nobody believed them, they were able to make a positive impact on the world and serve as an inspiration to others who may be facing similar challenges. Thanks for viewing today's episode of our True Crime Channel's crime documentary. We hope you found the content both intriguing and educational. We are passionate about uncovering the truth behind the most disturbing and perplexing cases. To never miss out on our latest videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. Take care and stay informed until we meet again.